Hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture six. Um, in this lecture, we'll be talking about subsequences of sequences and the limits of subsequences and what we can say about those. Uh, in this part here, I would like to just introduce the concept of subsequences, um, give a handful of examples, and prove one basic theorem about um, what we know when we can know that there is a subsequence of a given sequence converging to a particular uh, number, okay? So first off, let's just sort of define what a subsequence is. So, I, well, I'm not, I don't wanna state, I'm not gonna write out the whole definition. I'm just gonna, it's a very intuitive concept. So I'm just gonna kind of like illustrate it for you. So let's say we have a sequence. So let's say SN is a sequence. Okay, then a subsequence would be what you would get by basically, you know, going through SN. So let's write out some terms of SN. S4, S5, S6, S7, S8, S9, S10, S11. S12, bunch of terms, so on. Okay, and then pretty much we can pick um, some terms of this sequence to make a new sequence. That's all a subsequence is. And of course, remember that sequences in our world always have to be infinite. So there's no such thing as a finite subsequence. So no finite, just remember sequences or subsequences, right? I mean, subsequences are sequences in their own right. So one subsequence would be, you know, if I take um, S2 and like S3 and maybe S6 and S10, S11, you know, and so on, then, so this was uh, SK, you know, the book's notation would be that they could call this, you know, you could call this TK and then it would be, you know, S2, uh, hold on, let me sort of align these a bit better. S2, um, S3, uh, S6, S10, S11, and so on, right? Uh, so what they, they have a notation here, which is saying um, TK is SNK. So NK are like this, the sequence is the sequence of indices, okay? So here in this example, so this notation, it can be kind of confusing. It takes a bit of time to get used to uh, because of these like nested subscripts. But here, um, oops, let me switch back to black color. So here, uh, you know, oh, sh oh, I forgot to, I accidentally deleted the K, that's important. Uh, Okay, so here um, NK is, you know, so the sequence NK is um, 2, 3, 6, 10, 11, and so on, right? So this would also be called T1, right? So here we have like T1 is S2, T2 is S3. So this is uh, T1, you know. T2, T3, T4, T5, right? This is K, K equals one, two, three, four, five, and so on, right? So here we have TK, it's equal to SNK. NK is the sequence of indices that picks out our subsequence. So hopefully you get the picture, okay? Uh, it, it is really a straightforward concept. It's just the notation for it has to be kind of annoying, unfortunately. Okay, so let's move on to our theorem here. So we're gonna be interested in, if you're given a sequence, what kind of subsequences does it have and what are their limits? That's kind of our one of our focuses, okay? Uh, and this is especially helpful for analyzing divergent sequences because when a sequence diverges it doesn't have a single limit but it kind of like has a collection of 
points where you can find subsequences that approach different uh, limits. And so if you know about those limits, then you kind of know something about the nature, about the behavior of this uh, divergent sequence. So here's our theorem. Um, this is 11.2 uh, and it has a couple parts. Um, so let's see, right. So let SN Actually, I'm going to make a cut while I uh, write this out. Okay, so this is the theorem we would like to prove. And it just states, it's, it sort of gives some conditions when, under which you can tell that there's a subsequence of a given sequence which uh, converges to a certain, or which uh, has a certain limit. And um, in these, in, in all, so the first case deals with finite limits and then the second two are infinite. And in all cases, the subsequence that this theorem tells you exists can be taken to be monotonic. And so this monotonicity thing will be, will make the proof like a little bit more complicated, but it's really not that bad. So the second two cases are, are, I would say relatively easy. Um, so let's, let's just look at case two or the, not cases, but um, the parts of the theorem. So I'm actually just going to describe the proof of, of two first. So um, for two here, uh, if Sn unbounded above, uh, we can find, uh, you know, N1 such that Sn1 is greater than one, right? I mean, otherwise one would be an upper bound. Then take N2 greater than N1 such that Sn2 is greater than 2, right? Uh, so the reason we can find N2 bigger than N1 for which this is true, which by the way, that's important, okay? Uh, the reason we can find, because we need to choose the subsequence in, you know, ascending order of indices, right? The indices have to go up. You can't make subsequences by taking like one entry from a sequence and then an earlier entry from the sequence and then a later one. Right? You can't go backwards in the sequence. You can only go forwards. But um, if we couldn't find N2 bigger than N1 for which this was a true, then two would be an upper bound for all of the entries of the sequence after N1. So then the sequence would be bounded above by you know, two and whatever the biggest uh, term in the sequence was before N1, which is a problem. So we have to be able to find one after N1 where this is true. But also we have to be a little bit careful because um, you know, we don't want to accidentally choose SN1 to be really big and then SN2 to be smaller. Like if we chose SN1 to be like 100, if that was somewhere in the sequence, and then maybe SN2 would be like seven or something, then the sequence would go down. And we're trying to choose a monotonic subsequence, remember. So all we have to do to do that is actually just make this be bigger than the maximum of um, SN1 and two, right? And then take N3 bigger than N2, such that SN3 is greater than the maximum of SN2 and 3, right? And just keep doing that, you know, take NK plus 1 greater than NK. So we do this kind of uh, inductively. Is, that's how, how you describe this definition. It's an inductive de definition. SNK plus one is greater than the maximum of SNK and K plus one, right? Then clearly this subsequence will go to infinity. So SNK will go to infinity as K goes to infinity. Remember, K is actually the true index here. NK is just a sequence of indices that we're plugging into S to get the uh, subsequence. But K, K is really the number which keeps track of the position in the subsequence, right? Okay, so let's uh, look at, and then, uh, you know, part three here is basically the same thing. So let's look at part one. This one, I'm just gonna sort of outline and maybe draw a picture. Uh, I'm gonna outline the process. It's actually a very similar, it's similar in spirit, okay? Basically, we're gonna keep, we're gonna pick a term in our subsequence and then we're gonna try to pick one that's even closer and then we're going to keep picking things that are closer and closer to the limit we're trying to get to. Um, the tricky thing about it is, uh, you know, so 
proof of one, outline. Pick S and one, then pick SN two closer to T, then SN one and so on, right? But there are two tricky things here, okay? First of all, if we just pick SN2 to be closer than SN1, right? We might accidentally, like if here's T, and let's say this is T, you know, well, okay, I don't, okay. I won't draw this, but, but let's say this is T and then, you know, we pick, uh, you know, SN1 and then we pick SN2, right? And then we pick like SN3 and then we keep picking them getting closer to T, but not getting close enough to T, right? Then uh, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll get closer to T, but they won't converge to it, which is a problem. So we have to actually force SN, like SNK, we have to force it to get arbitrarily close to T by, pick, by basically taking sort of bubbles around T, making these uh, sort of neighborhoods around T that get smaller and smaller and smaller and approach zero in size and keep picking entries in the sequence that are within that. So let's say here we have um, T minus uh, one, T plus one, and then like, you know, T minus one half, T plus one half, T minus one third, T plus one third, right? Uh, and so on. So we keep making these smaller bubbles, right? Take, take intervals, I guess, around T of radius one over N, right? Uh, and pick S N or one over K, let's say, sorry, one over K. pick SNK in each respective one, right? So if we pick SN1 to be within this interval of radius one, and then pick SN2 to be within this inter interval of radius one half, and SN3 to be in the interval of radius one third, so let's say like SN1, and then like, you know, SN2, and SN3, right, and so on. That would give us a sequence, a subsequence of, uh, of the original sequence, which actually converges to T, which is good. Then the only thing left is to figure out how we can do it to make sure that it's monotonic. And here's how. So basically, like in this picture, it wasn't monotonic. To make it monotonic, all you have to do is first, oops, uh, first ask the question, on which side of T are there infinitely many values of SN? So on one side of T, there are infinitely many SN on at least one side, okay, of T. Why do there have to be infinitely many SN on at least one side of T? That's because, um, so sorry, I had to make an edit there. Um, so what I was saying is, um, why do there have to be infinitely many uh, values of SN on at least one side of T? That's because there are infinitely many in each of these intervals by, by the assumption, right? So infinitely many of them have to be on at least one side. If there were only finite number on either side, then there would be a finite number total. So there has to be infinitely many values on at least one side of T within this interval. And, uh, w and then you basically, uh, whichever side it's on, you pick the sequence to approach T from that direction. So let's assume that there are infinitely many values on the left, to the left of T, so below T, less than T. There are infinitely many values. Then what you can do is, okay, let's choose SN1 to be within this bubble of radius one. Now here's the problem. We might accidentally choose it to be very close anyway, right? But if we choose it to be really close, let's say SN1 was here. 
right? Then just choose SN2 to be within the bubble, within the neighborhood whose radius is like the minimum of either one half or SN1, right? If SN, or like the distance from SN1 to T. Whichever one of those two things is smaller, pick the next term of the sequence to be within that radius, okay? And then change this, change the, uh, the, the sort of controlling radius to be one third and pick, you know, the third term of the sequence should be either within the bubble of radius one third or closer than SN2, whichever one of those two things is closer to T, okay? And so you just keep doing that over and over again. Uh, and that's how you get your sequence. So um, that does it for this part of the video. Uh, and in the next one, we'll look at some examples of subsequential limits and subsequences. Okay.